Hello everybody, welcome to the second video on compressible flows. My name is Pedro Volpiani and today we're gonna discuss the equations that govern the fluid dynamics. The conservation laws that control the fluid dynamics can be mathematically formulated following either a Lagrangian material volume or an Eulerian control volume approach. In the Lagrangian specification of the flow field, the fluid parcel is followed as it moves through space and time. This can be visualized as sitting in a boat and drifting down a river. On the other hand, the Eulerian approach focuses on a specific location in the flow region as time passes. This can be visualized by sitting on the bank of a river and watching the water pass the fixed location. Based on these two descriptions, changes in the fluid properties can be measured either on a fixed point in space, while fluid particles are crossing it, or by following a fluid parcel along its path. Let's consider a field variable phi that is both dependent on t and x, which may be a scalar or a vector quantity representing density, velocity, temperature, etc. The Lagrangian substantial or material derivative of this quantity, denoted capital D phi capital DT, can be derived through application of a chain rule to account for changes induced by all independent variables along the path and is given by the following expression. This tells us that the total rate of change of quantity phi as the fluid parcel moves through a flow field is equal to the sum of the local rate of change and the convective rate of change of phi. In most gas dynamics problems, it is more convenient to examine a fixed region in space, or a control volume. Since tracking individual particles either in an experiment or practical application is very hard and sometimes impossible, we focus our attention on what happens at a fixed point as different particles go by. That's the principle of the Eulerian approach. Let's remember what the Reynolds transport theorem says. Let capital B be any property of the fluid, mass, momentum, energy, and let B be the intensive value of capital B, amount of capital B per unit mass. For an arbitrary moving and deformable control volume, the instantaneous total change of capital B in the material volume is equal to the instantaneous total change of capital B within the control volume, plus the net flow of capital B into and out of the control volume through its control surface. Let ρ denote the density of the fluid, n the outward normal to the control volume surface, and u the velocity of the fluid. Then, the Reynolds transport theorem gives the following expression. We can then apply the divergence theorem to transform the surface integral into a volume integral. This final equation can be used to derive the Eulerian form of the conservation loss in fixed regions. Let's now talk about the conservation equations. Let's consider first a finite material volume, V of t, moving with the fluid. The finite material volume is formed by a set of fluid particles which are always the same. It's recalled that a fluid particle is the smallest fluid element whose microscopic properties are not influenced by individual molecules. Let dm be the mass of all the molecules of a fluid particle of elementary volume dv. The density of the fluid, rho, then verifies dm equals rho dv. The mass of fluid contained in this volume is given by the integral rho dv. The temporal variation of the mass m when the material volume moves with the fluid is by definition given by the material derivative of m. Since the mass of each fluid particle is conserved during the movement, the same applies to the overall mass m. Let's consider now a fixed control volume v with a control surface s through which the fluid flows freely. The principle of mass conservation applied to a control volume v means that the rate of change of the mass inside V is equal to the mass flow through the control surface S. If more mass enters the control volume than it leaves, the rate of change will be positive, expressing an increase of the mass in V. In the opposite case, a negative rate of change 
corresponds to a mass of fluid leaving V greater than the mass of fluid entering it. The vector mass flux is rho ui with units mass per area time. In mathematical terms, we have this expression, where n denotes the unit vector normal to ds conventionally pointing outward from the control volume. Thus, if the velocity vector u also points outward of the control volume, the mass flux rho u times n is positive. In other words, with this choice of orientation of the normal, which is a quasi-universal convention, a mass flow going out of the control volume is counted positively and conversely, a mass flow going in the control volume is counted negatively. Moreover, since the control volume considered here is fixed, the temporal derivative can go inside the integral. In the case where the density is continuous on V, this hypothesis excludes the presence of a shock, we can apply the divergence theorem and transform the surface integral into a volume integral. Note that the Reynolds transport theorem gives exactly the same result. Since this integral is zero for an arbitrary control volume V, this means that the integrated function is identically zero. So we obtain this final expression. Let's now present the momentum conservation equations. Let's consider first the case of a material volume moving with the fluid. The principle of Newton's second law states that the time rate of change of momentum of the fluid in the material control volume must equal the sum of all the forces acting on the fluid in that volume. The temporal variation of linear momentum contained in the material volume V of t is by definition its material derivative. And Newton's second law is written as follows, where the vector f designates the sum of the forces acting on the material volume. Note that the equation of momentum is a vector equation that leads to a three scalar equations in the case of a three-dimensional flow. The term F is broken down into two types of forces. Volume forces that act over the entire control volume. It's in most cases gravitational forces. We denote G the force per unit mass acting on the fluid. G is usually the acceleration of gravity. The volume force acting on V is therefore the integral of rho G dV. We also have surface forces acting at the control surface S. These forces are due solely to two sources. One, the pressure distribution imposed by the fluid surrounding the material control volume, which acts in the normal direction of the material volume surface and two, the viscous stresses related to the viscosity and the state of the fluid deformation. These stresses can be normal or tangent to the control surface. Surface forces are written in the general form as the integral surface of T times N dS. The stress tensor T is symmetric. That means that Tij equals Tji. The TII terms are the normal stresses, and the Tij with I different than J are the shear stresses. In a fluid at rest, only the pressure P acts in the fluid surface in the opposite direction of the normal N, and consequently T equals minus P delta. In a fluid in motion, we need to consider the viscous stresses. Then, the stress tensor T can be decomposed as minus P delta plus tau. We can therefore finally write the non-conservative integral form of the momentum equation. In the case of a fixed control volume, we use directly the vector version of the transport theorem, in the case where the material control volume V of t coincides with the control volume V. This vector equation is the conservative integral form of the momentum equation. We can rewrite it in the form of a scalar equation on the components of the linear momentum vector. To obtain the momentum equation in differential form, we have to transform the surf integrals into volume integrals by applying the divergence theorem. Thus, we have the conservative differential form of the momentum equation, or written in fully developed form. 
remember that we still need to model the stress tensor. Air belongs to the family of Newtonian fluids. For such fluids, the viscous stresses depend linearly on the fluid deformation, hence on the velocity gradients, according to the following relationship. Here, mu denotes the dynamic viscosity of the fluid and delta ij denotes the components of the unit tensor delta, which satisfy delta ii equal 1 and delta ij equal 0 for i different than j. The viscosity mu is a property of the fluid considered but also depends on the local thermodynamic state of the flow. For temperatures below 3000 Kelvin, the air viscosity can be considered independent of the pressure and only the temperature dependence needs to be taken into account. This dependence is well described by the so-called Sutherland law, where the temperature T is given in Kelvin and mu in kilogram per meter per second. In a large part of this course, we are going to consider ideal fluid flows. That means, fluids with no viscosity. In the absence of viscosity, the viscous stress tensor is identically zero. In the case of a supersonic flow inside a nozzle, for example, the characteristics of the flow obtained by assuming air as an ideal fluid are correctly reproduced. The differences between prediction and observation are related to not taking into account the effects of viscosity in the boundary layer region near the nozzle walls. The first principle of thermodynamics applied to the material control volume states that the rate of change of the energy contained in the material volume is equal to the sum of the work done per unit of time by the external forces applied to the material volume and the heat flow which passes through unit of time through the material surface. The rate of change of the total energy contained in V is given by the sum of the work per unit of time done by the external forces applied to V and the heat flow per unit of time through S. Both surface forces and volume forces need to be considered to compute the total work acting on the material volume. The work is expressed as the product of a force by displacement. A work per unit of time is therefore the product of a force by a speed. We thus have the following expressions. The heat flux through the material surface can have two origins. 1. Heat transfer through the control surface related to the presence of temperature gradients. This is called thermal conduction. And 2. Radiation. We will limit ourselves in this course and we will take into account only the thermal conduction. The conductive heat flux per unit area and time is noted Q and is related to the temperature T of the fluid by a Fourier law, where lambda denotes the thermal conductivity of the fluid. It is in principle a function of the temperature T, but this dependence can be neglected in the context of the course applications. The elemental heat flux that passes through a unit of time and surface through an infinitesimal element ds of the control surface S is given by minus Q times N ds. The negative sign comes from the orientation of the normal unit vector N in the fact that the heat received by the system under consideration is positive. And therefore, the heat flow through S per unit of time is given by minus the integral of Q times N ds. If now we gather the last expressions, we can write the integral form of the energy equation. The transport theorem applied at a time t where v coincides with v of t makes it possible to write the conservative integral form of the conservation equation of energy. To obtain the differential form of the energy conservation equation, we start from the integral form and we transform the surface integrals into volume integrals. Here, we implicitly assume the continuity of the flow on the control volume V. We have the following expressions for the work per unit of time and the heat flow per unit of time. From this, we deduce the conservative form of the energy equation.
For a non-viscous and adiabatic flow in the case where the effect of gravitation is negligible, the latter hypothesis being generally valid if the fluid is a gas, the general equation is reduced to the following, where the total specific enthalpy, Ht, equals E plus P over rho. If the flow is stationary, then the first term vanishes, and we have that the divergence of rho Ht u equals zero. And taking into account the mass conservation, we obtain the following relationship, that reflects the fact that the total enthalpy remains constant along the streamlines of a steady flow of non-viscous fluid. The stationary energy equation for a perfect fluid flow with uniform generating conditions up to infinity is thus reduced to ht equals h infinity equals constant. Therefore, the total specific enthalpy will remain constant in the flow unless heat is added into the system, if the flow passes by a combustion chamber, for example. Here we extend the Reynolds transport theorem in the presence of discontinuities. Suppose that the domain we follow has a surface of discontinuity that we will call sigma of t, which has its own normal velocity w. The Reynolds transport theorem takes the following form, where brackets b is b2 minus b1 if capital N is the unit vector normal to sigma oriented in the direction 1 to 2 as indicated in the figure. Let's now generalize the balance equation, where phi b is the diffusion flux of b across the surface and p b is a production term. If phi b is piecewise continuously differentiable over v except in sigma, then we have the following expression. In the final balance equation reads like this. We see that the balance equations are the same as the ones previously derived. The solely difference is now that the jump condition sigma must be satisfied. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to visit my website for more videos and exercises. See you in the next lecture.